moving toward more equitable science assessments for English learners. My name is Tracy Noble, for anyone who doesn't know me, and I'm from Turk. Um, and um, I wanted to say something before launching in, which is that as everybody here knows, the current pandemic is a source of incredible stress for all of us and for children in schools, for teachers trying to teach them, but in particular is a source of stress for English learners in US schools because of the limited access many of them have to the internet and to devices for doing work from home. Also the limited availability that many of them um, that there is of online instruction that's sensitive to the needs of English learners and the limited social support from peers who speak the same language that they're getting now due to not being in school. On top of this, there are the financial work and health challenges that we know are hitting immigrant communities and communities of color particularly hard right now. And on top of that, the opportunistic stoking of xenophobia and racism that's been one response to the current pandemic. And to the associated policy changes that actively exclude immigrants. So while we're all trying to deal with the current situation and the stresses in our lives and trying to help our families immediately and help our neighbors in the short term, I'd like to encourage you all to think about longer term goals to work towards equity in education in ways that can welcome and support EL students when they're able to come back to school as soon as that's possible again. I have one more reflection just before starting, before getting into this, which is that the term English learners or ELs is a limited one. Um, it's limited in many ways, and most of the students we work with would be much better described as emerging multilingual students because they have skills in many areas of language and in multiple languages and are learning a lot of them at the same time. However, the category of English learner has a particular meaning in federal and state education policy and thus influences how schools classify, group, and teach students. And for this reason, we use the term EL to highlight the particular challenges faced by students who are classified in this way. All right, let's get going. And um, we're gonna, uh, so I first wanna highlight my co-authors on this presentation. Anne Roseberry, who many of you know, and Catherine or Katie Bowler of the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, which from here on I'll call DESI. Katie is head of MCAS test development at DESI and has been a partner in this work from the beginning. I'd also like to um, call out the roles of many of these colleagues who have been at Turk or currently at Turk or at, at associated organizations. They contributed to all of the work that I'll be presenting here today. In addition, none of this work could have been done without the close collaboration with a core group of teachers and administrators from across the state of Massachusetts and all the generous teachers, parents, and students who gave up their time to participate in research with us. And um, this presentation is dedicated to them. So how is research on science assessments relevant to you? We created this slide because we figured not everybody here does assessment for 100% of their time. And so I wanted to point out the fact that it's relevant to developing assessments of all kinds, not just mandated statewide assessments, but also to development of curriculum and to professional development. Well, how could it be helpful? So first off, it offers ways to make more equitable science assessments for English learners. But on top of that, we hope that it will offer an expanded perspective on all materials you create for students, teachers, and parents. So let me give you an overview so you know what to expect and when there's gonna be a break. <laughs> so um, I'll start out with about 10 minutes describing the research work, about 30 minutes on main findings. That 30 minutes is partway through gonna have a five minute break for clarifying questions. So if you have things that are gonna help you make it to the end without this nagging question in mind, Put those in the chat or save them for the and, and please save them for that time um, and call them out then and then i'm going to once we finish the five main findings after the clarifying questions i'll have five main takeaways for five more minutes and then hopefully we'll have 15 minutes for q a and i'm willing to stay on longer than that but we're hoping to make the main session fit within this hour all right so i'm going to go ahead and get started on the main session so, assessing what English learners know and can do in science in English is difficult. 
it's very nice to be saying this in front of an audience who like recognizes that and that's all clear to them. Assessing what ELs no one can do in science is difficult because it takes place at the intersection of two domains in which ELs are learning, English language and science. And so how students perform on science tests depends on what they know and have learned about English and what they know and have learned about science. So in this series of projects, we investigated how the language of science test items affects EL's abilities to show what they know on science tests. We partnered with the Massachusetts Department of Elementary and Secondary Education, or DESI, and so we focused on the Grade 5 Massachusetts Comprehensive Assessment System Science and Technology Engineering Test, the MCAS STE. That part required the most practice of anything it did here. So we chose the MCAS because it's a well-regarded test and so and historically has been. So it allowed us to investigate issues that are, if they arise on the MCAS, are likely to arise on other states' tests and other tests used by consortia of states. So what actually did we do? Well, it was nine years of research that I'm trying to summarize for you today, spread across two projects, both of them funded by the Institute of Education Sciences. And the first project focused on multiple choice test items. These are the bulk of the items on the MCAS test. They are one point each. You get one point if it's right and zero points if it's wrong. For this project, we did a correlation study. We did interviews with grade five EL, former EL, and non-EL students about these multiple choice items. And we did a linguistic simplification study in which we took original test items and changed them to try to make them more accessible for English learners while keeping the tested science content constant. Okay, the second project focused on constructed response test items also known as open response test items. These are items that ask students to write several sentences in response to one or more writing prompts. So these items are worth four points each, as opposed to one point each for multiple choice items. However, there are fewer on the test. The current MCAS has four of these versus 34 of the multiple choice items. So we did analyses initially of who skipped these constructive response test items to see which students were more likely to just say, I can't do this at all. We also did interviews again with grade five EL, former EL and non-EL students about these items. And we did multiple regression analyses to look at the factors influencing students' performance. In all these studies, we were focused on paper-based test items because the state is just now completing the transition to computer-based science testing. But we think that many of the testing formats and much of the language used in the computer-based items we've seen is similar to what we've seen in the paper-based items. So a lot of these findings we think can transfer over. So now one technical point that I just want to touch on here. Um, is one of the measures we um, used for multiple studies. So for the most part, we used a measure called differential item functioning, or DIFF, to measure how ELs were performing on test items compared to non-ELs. And DIFF was a dependent variable in many of our statistical analyses, meaning it was a variable we were trying to predict when we were looking at other features of test items. Like for instance, how, how long were the test items? How did the longer test items affect diff. So diff measures whether ELs and non-ELs who score the same on the other items of the test score differently on one particular item that we're focused on. And it's one indicator of possible test item bias. And let me just show you how it works for one item. So the, these are the diff graphs for one item. It's item 12 from one year of the MCAS. I don't remember which one. And the x-axis is students raw score on all the other STE MCAS items. So the students could store, score anywhere from two up to 53 on the other items. But for this particular item, they had a probability of answering correctly because IRT was used in this analysis. So this is given in terms of a probability um, that uh, was higher consistently for the blue graph, the non-ELs, than for the green graph, the ELs. So for example, if we look at the red line, which goes, I believe, from 26 upward, it means all the students for whom that line 
where that line intersects the graph is all the students who got a raw score of 26 on all the other items. So we're saying they're doing about equal on this. They have supposedly equal knowledge of science and technology and engineering, but the non-ELs are scoring much higher on this particular item. And that's true no matter what score you pick on the other items. So that means this particular item, item 12 on this test, is something we should look at hard and is something that is likely problematic for um, other reasons in terms of the language. So now let's look at what some of those other reasons are. I'm not gonna report a lot of statistical information um, in this talk, because there just isn't time. But if you want more information about DIFF or any of our findings, let me know afterwards or email me afterwards. So now we'll go to the five main findings. The first one is words matter. The words you use in test items obviously matter for ELs, but let's get more specific about that. Which words are actually helpful for ELs when you include them in test items? Well, one thing we've found is that technical words are helpful for ELs. That is words with and terms that have meaning specific to a science discipline. So what do we mean by that? Well, examples of these are ecosystem, gravity, jet stream, and evaporating. So we looked for words where the first and most common meaning was located within a science discipline. In correlation studies of multiple choice items, we found those items with more technical words had lower diff, meaning they had better performance by ELs compared to non-ELs. Why do we think technical words can help ELs? Well, because they're often explicitly taught in science class. So ELs and non-ELs have equal opportunities to learn them. Now in contrast, let's look at the words that seem to interfere with EL test performance. What we found was unfamiliar non-technical words were most likely to interfere. So what are these? They're words that do not have technical meanings. So examples of these that we ran into in our items are the word hose repeatedly unusually specific and burrow. Initially, we define these words by using word frequency tables that look at all kinds of fifth grade reading and they see what words occur most often in these. A lot of these frequency tables are really out of date and they don't take into account the experiences of English learners. So we got better results in our second study when we um, had teachers of grade five ELs code items for words that they thought would be unfamiliar to their students. So this is what we saw when we asked teachers to code items for unfamiliar words. This is one particular item that we called tea kettle. And the teacher has highlighted in yellow the words that she thought would be unfamiliar to at least 20%, but up to only 50% of her grade five ELs. So you see the words cook, tea kettle, kettle, describe. And then in pink, she highlighted those really problematic words that would be likely to be unfamiliar to 50% or more of her grade five ELs. And so overall for this item, we got the words cook, tea kettle, spout, kettle, and describe coded by this teacher. You'll note that a phrase is also coded and a number of teachers coded phrases and that warrants an, another analysis um, that we hope to have time to do. So we had four teachers code each item, each of 44 constructed response items that were released by the state between 2003 and 2015. When we, in interviews, asked students to define these unfamiliar non-technical words, we got more support for the um, hypothesis that these were problematic. So you can see one student's definition of the word tea kettle in an interview and another student's definition of the word spout. And I'll let you guys read these. So why do we think unfamiliar non-technical words are sources of difficulty for ELs? Well, many unfamiliar non-technical words are likely to be learned at home, not in school, or at any rate are not explicitly taught in school, even if they are used in school. Therefore, many ELs may not have the opportunity to learn these words in English, even though they may know the word in translation in their own language. Let's go to our next main finding, which is that how words are put together matters. So we looked at how words were put together in certain patterns to create meaning in sentences, 
and to create meaning across sentences in test items. And in multiple choice items, we found two specific word patterns that influence performance of English learners. These are forced comparison and reference back. And I'll define these in the next slides. These are patterns that combine sentences in ways that are complicated and in at least one case, not used in everyday English. So students who are learning to speak, read, and write English may have particular difficulties with them. So the first one, forced comparison, is a feature that appears, is a pattern that appears frequently in multiple choice test items. And it occurs in those items that ask for an extreme case, such as the best, the most likely, the greatest, et cetera. So these items force students to compare all answer choices and select the one that fulfills this extreme case requirement. An example is this item, earthworm. I'll just read it out. Um, an earthworm was placed on top of a thick layer of moist topsoil in a pan. The pan was placed in a room with the lights on. How did the earthworm most likely respond to these conditions? So the student is expected to exhaustively compare all the answer choices to find the response that's the most likely given these conditions. Now the next word pattern we'll talk about is something we call reference back. In this pattern, the question sentence in the item refers backward to information that appeared earlier in the item and that you actually need in order to understand and answer the item. So conveniently, the same earthworm item also contains the reference back pattern. So the question sentence asks, how did the earthworm most likely respond to these conditions? Well, to know what these conditions are, you need to know what the meaning is of the previous two sentences about the thick layer of moist topsoil in a pan, and in particular, the pan being placed in a room with the lights on, because the lights are the main stimulus that the earthworm is being expected to respond to by burrowing under the soil, the correct answer for this item. Now, as exemplified from this item, a lot of multiple choice test items on the STE MCAS contain both force comparison and reference back features, and we found that those items in particular had high diff disfavoring ELs. In other words, those were particularly problematic for ELs. Well, why is that the case? We believe it's the case because a reader of these items must construct meaning relationships across sentences, then make inferences based on those relationships. And on top of that, know all the words and all the meanings in the answer choices in order to make the best choice or the, choose the most likely answer. This can be difficult for many readers who are working in their first language, let alone for readers who are still learning the grammatical rules, vocabulary, and meaning-making practices of a second language. So let's look at a student example. This is an example from our interview study, and I wanna let you know that at the end of this example, we'll have five minutes for clarifying questions, so pull those together in your mind. Um, this is an example from our interview study where we interviewed grade five ELs, FELs and non-ELs, 52 students total, about multiple choice test items. We're gonna look at an excerpt from an interview with a fifth grade EL student whom we call Yolanda, that's a pseudonym. Her first language is Spanish. She was given the earthworm test item and we've highlighted the most likely and that these conditions um, words to highlight the presence of the force comparison and reference back features in this item. So Yolanda was given a set of multiple choice items to answer. She happened to answer C by staying where it was placed for this item. Every student was asked a series of questions about the item after completing all the, after answering all the items in the packet. And I'm going to give you a few excerpts of Yolanda's interview. So the interviewer asked, so this one says like, most likely respond. Do you know what that means, most likely respond? Yolanda answered, most like, like much better, like something to say, something much better, something to speak about. Like if you were to say like, which one's much better, but you have to say it mostly like respond to an answer. So for Yolanda, most likely suggested most like or much better. Her response is similar to responses we got from two thirds of the students we interviewed, who we asked to define most likely. 
many of them gave alternative definitions like this. In addition, Yolanda also had an alternative definition of the word respond. It's a very reasonable definition of the word, but not appropriate to this particular situation where respond is meant to refer to behavior of the earthworm as opposed to her own response to the item. The interview proceeded as follows. The interviewer said, okay, and what about these conditions? Do you know what it's talking about when it says these conditions? Yolanda answered, it's like the answers underneath, like which one's much better, which one's much better of these answers. So you can see here for Yolanda, these conditions does not actually refer backward into the previous sentences of the text, but refers forward to the various answer choices, which you can sort of see makes sense. Um, as a result, she interprets the question sentence as asking her, which one's much better of these answers? So the interview continued as follows. Actually, this is the end of the interview. I should have said that. Um, at the end of each interview, the interviewer asks the student a simplified form of the item. So this is that part of Yolanda's interview, just so that you'll have more of a sense of what she actually knows about earthworms. The interviewer said, so if I said it in a little bit different way, like you have an earthworm and you put it on some dirt in a pan and then you shine light on the pan, what will the earthworm do? Yolanda answered, it would move. It would just like go underneath the soil. The interviewer asked, it would go under the soil? Why would it go under the soil? Yolanda answered, because the last time, like I think I saw it on TV, that earthworms don't really like the sun. So she was able to correctly answer a simplified version of the question supported by information from her experience, which suggests to us that the patterns in the way words were put together in this item were critical barriers to her understanding what she was being asked to do in the first place and thus led her to answer incorrectly. Now, at this point, I'd like to pause for questions. Um, if there are clarifying questions that's, that it's important to ask before we move on. Tracy, can I ask the question out loud or do you want me to type it? Uh, asking it out loud is fine. Oh, okay. It's Teresa. Sorry, Hi. you can see me in video. I, I can hear you. I, I know um, who it was. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I had a question about the released items issue. Yes. Which, uh, it seems like some of the released items are released because they are not good. And so, how, you know, maybe that item that is talking about the earthworm is just not a good item. Well, I don't think that's the main criterion for releasing items, um, that they're not good. Um, it's also the case that up until I think it was 2009, the state released all of the open response items. So it's only in recent years that we only have two of them. And my understanding is the main reason for that is uh, that they, it's very expensive to produce them. So they have to recycle some of them. But I don't, I don't think that the ones they're no longer recycling are necessarily terrible. It might may just be that they've already been used for three years, so they're ready to be shot out of the system. Um, if if Katie were here, she'd be able to answer that better. Um, but that's that's my take on that. Thanks. Sure thing. Sure thing. Um, can I ask a quick question? Sure it's thing. I wondered if you also have examples of questions that as they were published had very small diffs and if you um, are able to say, here's an example of a question that isn't differentially accessible by different, by ELs and non-ELs. Yeah, that's another great question. So um, we definitely saw differences in the level of diff, which makes talking about this really confusing. And as opposed to trying to um, highlight particular items and say, this is a good example, um, just do items like this. What we've tried to do across all the studies is to say what linguistic things are happening 
in the items that are bad versus the items that are good um, and that are leading to spread in the various statistical measures that we're using. And so um, we have those results more in terms of things like what we just talked about where um, the words with more technical words, sorry, the items with more technical words were better versus um, with more unfamiliar non-technical words. And that's for the most part how we have the findings. Um, there are some items that I would say, you know, we we think overall are good given their level or better than the others given their level of diff. And, um, but we think that they are less instructive than these general um, than these general uh, features of items that can be that um, may appear, you know, even in other disciplines. So, but if you have need of like, what's an example of a good MCAS item, then, you know, talk to me after. And no, it find was more, it was more that I think having, it's just another source, kind of the contrapositive of the ones that did have big diffs is to say that the ones that didn't had certain other characteristics or didn't have the bad characteristics. So, yeah, um, yeah. this is great. It's a great segue for my next slide. So that's okay. perfect. You have a couple other questions in the chat. I don't know if Great. you noticed. Um, I actually don't even have the chat visible to me because of the screen I'm on. Um, oh, I can read them if you want. That would be great, Valerie. Okay. Thank you. Stephen asks, did you see any noticeable diff results for negative based questions, i.e. which of these is not? Yeah, excellent question. Um, we in a project that happened prior to these had highlighted negatives as a really big issue for kids. It was sometime during that project span, and again, this preceded these nine years, when the state just removed all negatives from the language. I don't know if it's in response to what we said to them or not. Um, I hope that they just figured that out on their own, but they don't even use that anymore, which is awesome. But I've got to say, when it was in there, that was a huge issue because basically it meant at least 50% of kids didn't realize it was the negative form because they were so used to seeing the positive form. And so they were getting the item wrong for no good reason. And that, by the way, that same thing happens when there are pairs of words like increase versus decrease or even thick versus thin. For students who are learning English as a second language, those words are often learned together. And as we maybe know from learning additional languages, they're associated together. And then there's this extra step involved in saying which one is up and which one is down, like stalagmites and slag stalactites. It's always hard for me to remember that, right? And so we're, we were seeing that 50% of kids were thinking that thin meant thick or thick meant thin or increase meant decrease or decrease meant increase. So those are particularly tricky words associated also with negatives. But fortunately, the state doesn't use negatives anymore. It's a great question. Anything else, Valerie? Um, Martha had a question, and we've definitely hit your five-minute um, break. Anyways, well, let's just do that last one okay. and then yeah. go on. Uh, Martha says, did you have a separate category for words like scale, which has so many meanings, an item for weighing, for music, for a graph label? Yeah. Uh, did yeah. they increase diff? Yeah, that's an excellent question. In our statistical studies, we were not able to pull out the effects of polysemous words. However, in our interview studies, it was very clear that these were an issue. And so they were a particular target of linguistic simplification. And we don't have specific evidence that changing those um, on their own made a big difference because we always changed those in in combination with other things, but we do have evidence from interviews that the multiple meanings of words are quite important. Even simple words that we wouldn't think of, like this word pan in the earthworm item that is retained in the, the first line of the interview transcript that you see in front of you. One student said, well, a pan is like a frying pan that my dad uses to cook breakfast. So the earthworm is gonna wanna get out of that because that's going to be hot. So some of these multiple meanings that we gloss over, you know, I'm instantly thinking this is some kind of metal pan that looks like a cookie sheet, but it's used in science experiments. You know, where I got that image, I don't know. 
but for a child who's only seen a pan as the what eggs and bacon are fried in, that could be a problem. All right, so maybe I should go to the next slide now to keep on time. Is that okay, Valerie, do you think? Yeah, I think so. There was a question from Susan Joe, but maybe we can answer it at the end. Is that okay, Susan Joe? I'm sorry, I'm not seeing everybody, so I don't know if she said okay. Um, I don't know if she did either. I would, sorry, I was muted. Yes, that's fine. Okay, thank, thank you. you. We'll get to it at the end. All right, let's talk about some of the things that help um, students. I think this speaks to Andy's question a bit. We found that visuals help, and this is a generally known um, thing about test items that visuals are helpful for a lot of students. These are a couple of different items with visuals. One is a multiple choice item on your left where the visual just shows you what a compass is. On the right, you have a, an open response item in which the visual includes pictures of the plants and animals that you actually need to talk about when you're describing this ecosystem and the producers, consumers, and decomposers in it. So we investigated whether the presence of, of visual information in both kinds of items makes a difference for ELs answering these items. We defined a visual as any non-textual information that appears, and this included pictures, diagrams, tables, and charts. So what did we find about the kinds of visuals that can help students answering multiple choice items? Well, our first finding was that if you're given a multiple choice item, having any visual is better than having none at all. In addition to that, though, when we did our linguistic simplification study, the single most effective change that we could make to items was to add visuals to illustrate answer choices, especially answer choices with unfamiliar non-technical words. So if you're looking for a good item, it's not this one, but the next one. This is the original form of a test item about which object is the most flexible. And the words you see in red are words that we had highlighted as unfamiliar and non-technical for students. But our modification of this was to add pictures to these answer choices so that kids would know what they were choosing from among when they picked their answer. We found that ELs did much better on this item when the pictures were added and that the test scores of non-ELs or the scores on this item of non-ELs were not significantly increased. So we believe that this kind of change can be particularly helpful for ELs when there might be some terms in the answer choices that make it impossible for them to know what all of the answer choices are. So we also looked at visuals and constructed response items and we did statistical analyses to see which of them seemed most effective. That is, which of them helped to reduce diff the most. What we found was when these items included visuals of things you needed to write about in your answer, that was when they were most effective. So as we saw before, this prairie ecosystem one includes pictures of mushrooms and snakes, a coyote, a mouse, and grass and trees. And those are among the things you may wanna talk about in your answer. In the item on the right, which is actually a tech eng item, a technology and engineering item, students need to talk about how Rosa would use these items to find the depth of the well. And so the fact that the items are there and have these labels also seem to improve performance for ELs. That is, the level of diff was lower. Both of these, by the way, were found to be equally effective. So it's not always necessary to use labels, but we believe labels were necessary here because not all of these things may have been familiar to students, whereas they weren't necessary in the Prairie Ecosystem one because these are all things that kids had learned about in school already. So why do we think these visuals can help ELs? Well, probably for the reason that you all have imagined, that they provide additional non-linguistic information to help ELs to comprehend the text and potentially also support their writing, which is relevant to our next main finding. Constructed response items ask students to do something that multiple choice items do not, and that is write out an answer in English. We know that writing in a second language can sometimes come after fluency of speech, and so may, this may be a particular challenge even for ELs who are doing very well in spoken English. So, 
we wanted to measure the writing demand of constructed response items. And um, with no, we didn't find any precedence for this in the field. So we chose the simplest possible method of measuring this. We wanted to know how much you need to write in order to score four points. So we looked at this particular test item, any particular test item. This is one that we coded for writing demand. And then we looked at the two sample student responses available on the DESI website for any open for any constructed response item that score four points. So they provide example student responses that score four, three, two, or one points. We chose the four point ones because we wanted to know, you know, how much do you have to write to actually get the full points on this item? Now, it's important to note that the fact that they publish this is exceptional, not every state does. And the fact that they publish this allows us to do this work. However, they did not publish these answers for this purpose. They did not publish them to exemplify how long an answer has to be. They published them to exemplify what ideas need to be covered. So these may not be necessarily um, right on the average of what students who scored four points got. However, they were what we had um, and they were the best measure possible. So we went with this. So we counted the number of clauses in each student's four point answer. I was originally gonna count number of sentences and then we realized some students were really good at adding clause after clause on one sentence where other students were very pithy with individual sentences, lots of periods. So clauses was a better measure of the idea units in an item. And then the next thing we did was take an average across these two samples. So we were fortunate to have the two to get a number of clauses for this item, which is 15, which turns out to be right smack in the middle across all the 44 released items that we had. The minimum was zero. That was one item where you had to just provide nouns and the maximum was 29.5. The average was about 15. So then we thought we'd share with you um, what do EL students' responses look like um, to this item where a score four response looks like what you just saw. So these are responses. I'm going to give you first a response from Gail, an EL student whom we interviewed. Her first language was Portuguese, and her access level was 2.8 on a scale of 1 to 6. So 2.8 is fairly low. She may have arrived within the previous two years in the US. Um, so her answer for this item, and you remember seeing multiple paragraphs of writing for the score four answers, her answer was one word in English, which is light, and then three words in Portuguese, um, which was translated as thing of air, which we think meant perhaps fan or air conditioner. Um, then we have a response from another student, Esther, whose access level was 4.3. And she was able to write much more. And she actually wrote full sentences for three things that she thought answered the writing prompts um, requests. So you can see the difference across access level, which would have significant impact on student scores. And by the way, writing that's not in English doesn't get scored. So um, Gail would not have gotten any points for a uh, thing of air. So what did we find when we looked at writing demands? So we found the writing demands for each of these items. And then we looked at, um, we looked at diff for all of those items. And we found that ELs scored lower compared to non-ELs. So those diff graphs were, the spreads were wider um, on constructed response items with higher writing demands. So items that required kids to write more, um, ELs were scoring much lower on. Now, why is that? Well, ELs may have science knowledge that they're not able to share in this format, but may actually be able to share in other ways in the classroom, which is a great segue for me to the next major finding, which is that there's a mismatch between how ELs can show science understanding in the classroom and how they are allowed to show science understanding on tests. So in order to talk about this, I thought it was important to look for some resource about how grade five ELs are reading in the classroom. And I went to WIDA for this because they 
created the access test that we use. And so they describe the kinds of reading to expect from students at different access levels. You'll see level one, two, three, four, and five here. So um, this is a reading task about analyzing the effects of the Earth's rotation. And WIDA has published this um, as part of their can-do descriptors, which are descriptors of things that they expect kids at each level as they are leaving that level. So these are kids at a 1.9, a 2.9, or a 3.9 to be able to do um, regarding reading and analyzing the effects of the Earth's rotation. Now, if we look at what kids are expected to do, it actually differs a lot from level one to level four. So in level one, students are expected to identify words and phrases in a text that have to do with the effects of the Earth's rotation. Whereas in level four, they're expected to be able to organize sentences. In addition, the support students are given differ across, or, ex or students are expected to do this task with different kinds of supports like illustrated texts in level one and two. In addition, manipulatives for level one, graphic organizers as well for levels two and three. And finally, working with a partner for levels all the way up to level four. Level five is a level at which students have normally been moved out of EL status. And of course, an item like this doesn't offer any of those supports and requires students to do a lot more than identify words and phrases. Now, if we look at how grade five ELs are writing in the classroom, we see similar kinds of things. So there are differences between how level one, two, three, and four students are expected to write. Level one students are expected to list things, level four expected to explain. And then if we look at the kinds of supports, Level one and two students are expected to write using illustrated word banks in their home language and English. Whereas um, level one students are expected to use graphic organizers along with level three and level four. But in an item like this, you'd be given a blank book to answer in. So you wouldn't have any of those supports and certainly not those first language supports. So we believe this item and other constructed response items have reading and writing expectations that diverge from WIDA's expectations for access level one, two, three, or sometimes even access level four students. And as a result are mismatched with what EL students are doing in school to communicate what they know. And thus, they may not be able to communicate things that they could communicate in the classroom and do know about when they're answering these constructive response test items. We see evidence of this in EL skipping these items. So this graph shows the number of omits for EL students scoring at these levels on the access test. So what you see is below about level 3.5, kids are omitting one, two, three, or four times. And level 3.5 is pretty high. Sometimes kids at level 3.5 in grade five have been in US schools for four to five years. So um, uh, let's see, the next slide just points out that EL students at lower access levels are skipping a lot of items. And if you're skipping four items, and these are kids averaging with a score of three on the access test. So that's a pretty high level of English proficiency. That's at about an intermediate level. You're still likely to skip four items, which cuts down your overall raw score by 16 points, 32% of the overall raw score you could get. So why is that happening? Well, some people might think that the EL students who are scoring lower on access maybe also know less science, but this is not what the data actually show us. So what the data show us when we take the EL students who were scoring at the mean on all their multiple choice items. So similar to the diff calculations, we said, let's, let's make students equal on another measure and then see how they score differently on this particular item which is constructive response item 30 in 2018. And what we saw was that students who scored on access test below about a 4.6 were very likely to get a zero or just give up on the item altogether. And it wasn't until you got above 4.7 that you would get one, two, three, or four points, depending on other things that vary, but not your English language proficiency score. 
So this really suggested to us that there's a threshold to get in, into the item in the first place and be able to make sense of it. And that's also what we saw in our interview study. Now, I know that I'm running a little bit long on time, so I'm going to go a little bit faster through this um, and just let you know that in, we did two interview studies. In the first one, we didn't allow any accommodations. And in the second one, we did allow accommodations because some of our le access level one and two students were not able to answer the items um, at all in the first study. So these are the kinds of accommodations we allowed. We allowed the interviewer to read the item out loud in English or read it aloud in translation. The result of this was that 50% of students interviewed in the second study who were access level one to two asked for it to be translated and 25% asked for it to be read aloud. And the result in terms of what kids wrote was that kids writing went from 73% to 100% on the items. In other words, not their score, but the number of items they wrote something for. And they were writing answers in English. In addition, we moved to 100% for kids writing something for at least half of the writing prompts. So let me now go to the, the five main takeaways. So our first one is technical words are helpful when they've been learned in school. Unfamiliar non-technical words, not so much. And having teachers of ELs identify these words is extremely help, helpful. Um, try to avoid forced comparison pattern or else make sure it's explicitly taught. Try to avoid reference back as well, that's clear. Visuals to illustrate anything you can, especially answer choices and unfamiliar non-technical words. Writing may not be the best demonstration of what ELs know about science, especially when you're requiring that writing in English in these formats that don't reflect classroom practice. So expanding options for students to show what they know in assessment context may be especially important. Also, the expectations of assessments may preclude some ELs even getting in and participating. And so for this reason, we think an expanded set of testing accommodations may be very important and useful. In a survey of a testing accommodations done across states, most states had a very limited set of testing accommodations allowed for ELs, and Massachusetts is one of those. So we do allow item read aloud in English or for the student to speak their answer, but we don't add allow these other things such as item read aloud and translation, which we found to be very important. So in conclusion, assessing what ELs know in science in English takes place at the intersection of these two domains of learning, English and science. And as a result, student perf performance on these tests depends on both English language proficiency and science knowledge. And if a test item or a whole test is assessing students' English proficiency rather than their science knowledge, it's not actually a valid measure of their science knowledge. Now I've got a resource list that um, we, Valerie and I will share with you that has some writing on this topic. And um, I think the way it's set up, I click and each new thing appears. I didn't realize I had done that. And now it's time for our final Q&A. There are a couple of questions that were asked. Um, Susan Joes, referring yes. back to Yolanda's interview, was, do we know what question Yolanda was thinking she was answering when she gave her initial response, i.e., why did she select the response she selected? Yeah, that's a good question, Susan Joe, and I'm sorry that I didn't get to it before. Um, so we we uh, turned ourselves in a we tied ourselves in a lot of knots trying to figure out exactly what Yolanda was thinking about and how she got to the answer that um, the earthworm should stay where it was placed versus burrow into the soil. And what we, I think, ended up concluding was that since she didn't think she was being asked about the earthworm, earthworm's response, but was being asked for her own response, that she potentially thought that she was supposed to give uh, the best representation of what she had just read about where the earthworm was, what the earthworm was doing. And the earthworm was just put down on this spot and then these things happened. So she, we think that she thought that. 
but the interview wasn't in depth enough that we were able to probe and say, well, why do you think that and these other details beyond what you saw? So thank you. And this was a kind of thing, by the way, that happened a lot, that the student had a different idea of what they were being asked and therefore they chose their answer that actually was the best answer for the question they thought they were being asked. Um, Tracy Wright's question is, how much does a student's familiarity with taking standardized tests matter? So I think it's very important. Um, we didn't measure that in particular, but there was something that I noted uh, that was a contrast between um, the EL and non-EL students whom we interviewed. And this was just kind of anecdotal report. It's not something we found consistently as a finding, but it felt like the EL students were taking the questions on the test as real questions, as if the person asking really wanted to know the answer to this question. And the student was making a good effort to give a good answer to that. And some of the non-EL students who had in general been in US schools for longer and had more experience with this test were doing more kind of thinking about what is, what are they looking for here? What kind of thing is it that they're trying to get from me here? Not let me do my best to answer this question as well as possible. And that kind of slightly cynical thinking about the test ended up being more effective for students answering the items. Um, yeah. So yeah, that's the one. So I, I think it's important, but we don't have uh, other measures of how and why. Judy Storyguard asks, has any research, sorry, scroll up, has any research been conducted on other MCAS? On the math MCAS and the ELA MCAS, I assume is the question. And yes, uh, there was a very important study by Martin Yellow in 2008 and 2009 on what was then the fourth grade math MCAS. So this was many years ago. I, um, I'm not sure exactly when she took her data, but it was before the math MCAS was moved up to grade five. And I don't know of more recent work on the math or the ELA MCAS, which doesn't mean it's not there. It just means that I've been paying attention to the work on science tests. In general, there's much more work in math and ELA around testing than there is in science. So if there were an area like that that you were interested in, um, I could give you some pointers to the kinds of places. Um, and, and it's definitely a bigger body of data. Scott Patterson asks, is there research like this with parents or other adults as opposed to kids that are less comfortable with English? For example, assessments with parents of students that require answering in English or adult ed programs? That's a great question and I do not know the answer to that. Um, there may be somebody here who knows more about that, who's worked with adult ed I don't know if Karen or Martha has run into any work like that. Okay, Teresa, Teresa, excuse me, asks, what should curriculum writers do when they don't have budget or personnel or time to do linguistic simplification? How can curriculum writers do the best for emergent multilinguals? Well, that's a really good question. And Teresa and I have engaged in um, linguistic simplification of curriculum uh, for English learners before, so we know how challenging it is. Um, and this is a question the state runs into a lot too, because their budget has been squeezed ever since NPL and CLB started. I believe that it's not an extra or an add-on that considering whatever percent of this, of your population this is, sh should be central to the curriculum writing. And I know that's easy for me to say when, you know, like I'm not working with a budget that already doesn't have that. But I think that it should be figured in and um, to the initial writing process and Honestly, something we've seen is that there are a lot of non-English learners who benefit every time we 
are able to provide these kinds of linguistically simplified items, including students with disabilities and students who are just not reading at the same level. So I think you make a better test or a better curriculum project or a better professional development project if you can use these principles from the beginning as opposed to as an afterthought. And I understand that it's always limited what it's possible to do. That's the best I can do right now. <laughs> Tracy Higgins says, I think some of this also extends to students with dyslexia, et cetera, as well. I also wonder about rural populations. Yeah, I think there are really important um, issues with rural populations and with students with various kinds of disabilities. I think that um, historically what's happened for English learners is that accommodations that have been developed for students with disabilities have just been routinely applied to English learners as if their issues are the same. So I don't want to go backwards and do the same thing and say, you know, just use these for students with disabilities, even though we've seen good effects in small studies on performance. So I think, you know, taking these to inform um, that development would be fine, but also looking at the large body of work on students with disabilities and testing and curriculum is very important. And then I think the area of uh, looking at rural students in relation to assessment and curriculum and science is an area that needs a lot more work. I think it might be time. I wonder if I, I don't need to go, but I just if anybody else needs to go, feel free. Don't feel bad about it. And hi, Atlas. <laughs> Hi. Hi. <laughs> and I'm happy to stay also if anybody does want to stay and ask more questions. There's one more question from Carla. Yeah. Um, and she asks, to what degree do you think your work on technical words and non-technical words, as well as supports like visuals, applies to curricular materials we develop for kids? So I haven't done the research on that, but I think that um, there's no reason to believe that a child reading these words on a page in a testing situation or in a curriculum situation is going to have a dramatically different experience. I think what a lot of good teachers of ELs right now are doing is taking curriculum materials that perhaps don't provide those supports and themselves adding those in by, saying, by bringing in physical objects and demonstrations. And so I think to the extent that curriculum materials can recognize that these are gonna be issues for kids encountering this kind of language and think about ways to either prompt the teacher to enhance learning for ELs or to um, provide more images themselves in student materials or you know, avoid certain kinds of language. Um, I think that that would be a help. Um, and that this is work that Teresa and I did um, some of it with curriculum materials. And I think we found a fairly smooth experience for kids working with a linguistically simplified version. Although I'll let her uh, say something about that if she wants to. Nope, she's good, okay. Well, in case anybody has to leave, I just want to thank you all for being here. I, I am really excited to get to see so many of you because it's been a while of being holed up at home. And it's really nice to get this kind of support for this work and have a chance to share it with you. And I'm happy to answer any more questions anyone has. I have one about translations. Yes. So, um, and we've talked about it a lot, but I just wanted you yeah. to just reflect on, uh, often people say, well, why don't you just translate the curricula? And in this case, you're doing tests. So that's a whole other ball of right. wax. But, you know, what is the role of translations, which I know puts a burden a lot into the writers, but they also, if your population is like mostly Spanish speaking, why not just translate your materials? Right. right. So, we found that translation could be very effective for test items. Um, all of our translators were interviewers of students and had worked with students in these communities, sometimes in the school, and knew the dialect of Spanish, for example, or Cape Verdean or Haitian Creole that students spoke. 
And I think that's a very important factor for translation to be um, sensitive to the, ish, the differences in dialect that can cause a Spanish translation to be unhelpful to a student for whom it's the wrong dialect, for example, and it, with other languages as well. I also think that studies have shown that the most effective use of translation is when the student has access to both the English and the translation so that if there are words that they actually haven't encountered in Spanish because maybe that particular year of school took place in English so that the word for um, parallelogram is only known in English not in um, Cape Verdean Creole for example then um, the student has access to both languages but I think people are still working on how to most effectively make translation available and I think computer adaptive testing, I don't want to look at it as a cure-all for anything, but I think it has shown some promise in terms of allowing students to um, have access on demand to translation or to illustration, having illustrated glossaries in which kids can click on a word and say, I don't understand this word, let me click on it and I'll get a picture of it. Um, in addition to allowing students um, multiple uh, language translations, which can be sometimes cumbersome for states doing paper tests. So I'm not sure that I really answered that question. I kind of got deep into the gobbledygook of the of the topic. So it's it's clearly complicated. Um, and just like writing a test for students in English, if you're going to do a translated version, you got to do a good job of it, right? So it's got to be a good translation that actually is going to be understandable by the students that you're providing it to. So. Thank you. Thank you for the question. Anybody else? Yeah, Tracy, can I ask a question? Please do. Um, so I'm curious, you've been doing this research for a number of years and you found a yep. lot of things that could really help and you've seen a little bit of a change in the testing itself and you, you, know, you claim that you don't really know whether your work has had an impact or others work. Do you have a sense at all like about the impact of your work in particular or anyone else's work in this field do you see since you've been doing it for so many years a nice change that you hope will continue um, so that there's so, more equity yeah so this is a, um, a part of the presentation that's that's actually missing that was in the CSQ presentation where my colleague Katie from Desi, who's head of MCAS test development talked about ways it's changed the ways that she looks at test items and so something I can say about that is that she has really become within the organization an advocate for English learners. And they've made a number of changes, including um, paying more attention to this forced comparison word pattern and trying to avoid using it, trying to avoid instances of reference back, um, being very attentive to vocabulary and the way they set up these contexts for items. And um, they're also considering some changes that I think might be a really big help, um, which would involve providing a word bank to teachers, to all teachers, so they know that phrases, for example, like which of the following or most likely, if they're going to be used, you tell teachers ahead of time, you do it that same way every time you're doing a forced comparison feature. And so you say, you, you know, you've just got to teach this, um, but you're, you're, sh you're showing your cards at the start. So that's one positive I'll say. Another positive that I'll say is that Rachel Pishoff, who used to work on this project, is now head of student supports for Smarter Balanced and is working with a group who, um, of people who previously had worked with Willie Solano Flores, who's one of the biggest names in this field. And they're developing a lot of innovative um, accommodations, which aren't even called accommodations, they're actually called designated supports, because they're just turned on for English learners, and they can choose among them for their test taking. And it's not a panacea, again, but it's very sensitive to the research in the field. So I think some of the things that Smarter Balanced is doing are really innovative. And I guess I'll also say that after giving the presentation to the CS Cubed audience, who were the state science supervisors across the um, country, Many of them wrote back and said they were trying to implement the findings. Um, so I think when people have the information, they are able to do things with it. At the same time, testing is one of these things that keeps having waves of political pressure crash over it and change it continually, in addition to technical things like moving to 
new set of standards and moving to computer-based testing. So I think we keep trying to push in one direction and a lot of other things are pushing them in other directions. So it's an incomplete, I feel like it's, it's not a complete <laughs> process yet. A lot more pushing needs to be done, but I'm seeing changes in how people are um, thinking about and talking about this and I have, I have real hope um, for the future for this being a more top of mind issue for people, particularly as CS Cubed has taken on equity in education as one of their main themes for the past few years. So. That must be really rewarding for you to see that change, you know, directly related to work that you've done. So congrats on that. And thank oh. you very much. And I just happened to notice Miriam. Hi, Miriam. <laughs> It's so nice that so many people were able to join us. Tracy, can you stop sharing your screen so we could all see? I'm so sorry. I didn't even realize. You sure you don't want to look at my list of publications for much longer? Thank you of course. for telling me. Can I say something? Please. So I, I don't know if, if this is a question or how it necessarily relates to your work, but one of the things I kept thinking about as you were going um, over your results is this sort of conflict between science being something actually we want kids to be doing as opposed to something they, they're reading about and answering questions about. Yeah. And so I, I don't know if that ever came into discussions or, or what you were doing because I, I mean it feels to me like for EL students it's a double whammy because first yeah. they're reading about something in a language they may only partially grasp um, and then being tested on it. And so yeah. odds are really stacked against them that it, it feels more like it's reading comprehension than science. Exactly, exactly. Yeah, I, I, I think those are excellent points. And I think, you know, in science, we should be particularly sensitive to that, right? Because we expect students to demonstrate science knowledge in these other ways that are actually really complex and specific to the field like running a you know an experiment or you know making observations of how something is growing or interacting with other things in its environment and um, what's so hard is that you know the whole accountability framework requires testing to be widespread high scale and cheap and for that reason we're using language and primarily English language as our measure of everything, which doesn't make any sense <laughs> and yet is happening. So, you know, one thing that um, I find myself continually doing when, whenever the idea that, you know, well, the NGSS requires people, the NGSS is saying, you know, we've got to get kids to be able to communicate about science. And so, you know, it's fine to test them in language, but there are actually a lot of different ways to communicate in science and writing things down in English is only a very limited part of that, even for scientists who function largely in English, right? There's been a limited amount of work um, by one researcher, Rebecca Koprova, on a testing regime called ONPAR, which is all online and very limited language. So kids do little experiments or predict the outcome of little experiments based on just visuals on the computer screen. And it has shown really good results with English learners, which I think is you know, very useful as a demonstration of the role of language. But it's not, it's, all those items are very expensive to develop, so it's not clear how it's going to get scaled up. Um, so there's this real bind if we're going to decide it's going to be broad scale, high stakes, and cheap, we're not going to get a very good test. So. Thanks. Sure. Sorry, it's not more uplifting than that. I have a question now that you took out your, you know, your, your references. Yes, sorry. Um, so I, as a parent, my district is suggesting through the grapevine that there will be all this testing happening in September, right? When school comes nice. back because there's been such little oh, uh, learning or whatever. Uh, they wanna know where kids are at and yeah. how much they lost, whatever the yeah. stuff means, right? But I'm wondering if you have um, a practitioner-oriented 
version of your papers that can be distributed to places like districts and teachers who are going to be making <laughs> assessments. And they may or may not have district support to really understand how to make them equitable, especially to mm -hmm. yes. Um, like a blog, very, very low, you know? Yeah, I, I guess I don't have something right now. I guess the, the best thing I can think of to offer in this moment, because everything's happening very fast, is the recording and also the PDF of this presentation, which includes the resources and the link will be on there. Because um, this is the first time I've really tried to look across all of the projects and say, what are all the findings? There are some of the presentations in the resources list that also are more practitioner oriented, but they're each an individual slice as opposed to an overview. Um, but we, we can talk more though, if you think there might be some way to make something more targeted that would be helpful. So let's, let's follow up on that. Um, I'm at a loss right now. So. Didn't mean to put you on the spot. No, no, that's, it's an excellent question. I really appreciate getting to talk with you guys about this. I had a quick question just about how did the yeah. participants within your study sort of fare uh, when you communicated the results of all this uh, to them? Was it I'm not I'm maybe perhaps not surprising, eye opening? What you know, what were what were their reactions? Oh, when you say the participants, who, who do you mean in particular? The, do you mean the students or the teachers or the administrators? Well, all the above, because I think they all have their respective roles that they, whether they feel they're adhering to the testing regulations, whether they feel that, you know, they're uh, the victims of the biases against them, um, things it. like so. Everybody, really. Everybody. Well, um, let me speak to the teacher's question first, because um, they're the group we've been in communication with the most, I guess. And we had a group we called our educators working group, um, working with us through the whole second project focused on open response items. And they really helped us shape the research all the way along the way. And we also shared our results of every study with them all the way along the way. So we um, got a lot of feedback from them. I would say the initial feedback we got from them when we came to them and said, do you want to be part of this? We're concerned about this was I've been waiting 10 years for somebody to come talk to me about this because I've been seeing these problems with this test for my students for the whole period of time that I've been doing this. And I think all along they've had other kinds of insights, but the overall sense has been you're, you're putting words and numbers and, you know, PowerPoint slides to things that I've known have has have been happening and you're connecting me with a community of other people who are seeing this too because sometimes they are the one or two people who care about not that all the teachers don't care about but who focus on English learners in their school so they got a chance to see what other people were doing and feel validated in that way um, as far as students we didn't really have a formal presentation to the fifth grade students with whom we worked. Um, a lot of them, however, were very willing to talk with us from the perspective of critics of the test and talk about um, how they would change the items, for example, to make them better and be very reflective about the items. And honestly, for some really difficult items to, to do this linguistic simplifications for, when we used the student suggestions were when we made the best linguistic simplification. So I think they were able to be real partners in this too. Um, for administrators like at DESI, it's, um, it's a little bit of a harder sell because they are sort of like the person on the rack who's being pulled in all these different directions. Um, in many cases by people more powerful than us, um, but they have really stuck with it and become more and more responsive over time. And we also see them taking on board some of our statistical measures in order to be better able to use the statistics they have to track the experience of English learners um, on their items. So I, I see for the most part um, welcoming and uh, that people feel this this um, 
the work makes sense, they understand it. And I guess for the teachers, it's validating. And for DESI staff, it, it puts extra work on them, but they're willing to do it. Um, so I hope that answers your question. Thank you. And thank you for bringing Atlas into the screen for us. He's gotten so big. Anybody else? Valerie, I'll take your cue for when you think we should um, shut I, it down. I don't have any other questions in chat. Um, okay. You, this is a great presentation, Tracy. You really, really Thank appreciate you. it. Your work is so important. Thank you. And um, that's what everybody's saying in chat. In chat, <laughs> and I'll send you a transcript of it so you can read it yourself. Oh, nice! I never am able to keep track of that in real time because <laughs> there's too many windows on my screen. Oh yeah. It, it's yeah. so nice to see you all. Thank you all for being part of this and taking time out of your day for this. And it's nice to see that you're healthy and well and ensconced wherever it is that you are, so thank you. And thank you, Valerie, for this opportunity. I really appreciate you putting this together. Yeah. Um, so, all right. You're welcome. Thank you, Tracy. Bye, everyone. Bye.